Hello, hello, and welcome back to Trying to Figure It Out. I'm Allie, and this week we are going to be talking about plastic surgery. With us this week, we have Dr. Jason Diamond. Welcome to Trying to Figure It Out. Thank you very much. I'm very excited that you're here. Dr. Diamond is a celebrity plastic surgeon who has worked with patients like Chrissy Teigen, Kim Kardashian, and so many more. I feel like every plastic surgeon kind of has like a specialty or a different thing. Would you say that you have a specialty? And if so, what would you say that that is? Well, again, I'm a facial plastic surgeon, so I only do facial work. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Now, there are other facial plastic surgeons out there, but that's my specialty. When I first came out Mm -hmm. to L.A., I spent about two years studying with all the top surgeons. Like, and these were the top surgeons in the world. And so basically I was living out of my car. Most people finish their residency. They come out, they hang a shingle and they start practicing. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to learn the best techniques from the most famous people, the most successful people, because I wanted to come out and I wanted to be the best. I didn't want to be a middle of the road person. I wanted to be the best and I wanted to be able to give my patients the absolute best the world had to offer. So I spent two years. So for facelifts, let's say. I found out who the most successful facelift surgeons in the world were, and they were all right here in Beverly Hills. The <laughs> most course. successful, most famous surgeons in the world are all right here. There's a couple outliers here and there, but in as in general, Beverly Hills is the mecca of the world, and people from all over the world know that, and when they want the best, they come here. So I found out who the best facelift surgeons were, and I would spend you know weeks and months learning that facelift technique from that surgeon, and then I'd find out who the other famous facelift surgeon was, and spend time with them. I found out who the most famous rhinoplasty surgeons were. Spend time with them. Found out who the most famous facial implant doctors were. Spend time with them. Oftentimes learning from people who like basically invented the fields. Like mm-hmm. I learned facial implants from the guys who invented the facial implants, you yeah. know? So, so this is kind of what I did. The techniques that I have curated from all what I learned and saw, and I kind of made it my own. I've I created that for myself. So there are a couple procedures that we do that that I really developed. And one is called diamond facial sculpting. It's an, actually an in-office procedure, a non-surgical procedure. One is the diamond instafacial. It's a skin, a medical grade skin procedure. My techniques have been honed and perfected to enhance somebody's natural beauty. How did you become the doctor that you are now? What was that first you know, big moment where you cross the line of not just seeing patients, but seeing high profile patients who trusted you with some of their most like prized possession, basically. So I start taking care of some pretty high profile people early on in my Mm -hmm. career, in early 2000s. But at the time, facial surgery was something that people even to this day don't talk about much. So even though I was taking care of some high profile people started coming in they're telling their friends and they're telling their friends. I was taking care of a lot of well-known people, but nobody ever talked about it. And, and then I would see like, I would see the same patients. They would talk about their dermatologist publicly. Yeah. Oh, look, we did for my skin. And I'm like, I just made your face look great, but they're talking about the derm <laughs> because talking about the, that, the less invasive things was a little less taboo yeah, absolutely. than talking about facial surgery. And so eventually we got into the social media game. I was very late to it. I don't think I put my first Instagram post up till probably 2014, maybe something like that, where people were doing it six, seven years earlier than me. Mm -hmm. But once we started doing that, we realized these patients would be like, oh, let me, let me, let me say something about you on Instagram or social media. I was like, okay, great. I didn't even know what it meant. And that kind of really expanded the knowledge that I, of the things I do. And I guess kind of opened up the public knowledge that I take care of all these types of people. For sure. It is interesting because I feel like especially in the early 2000s, it was a lot more taboo. People were like way more secretive about what they were getting done. And I also feel like there wasn't as many things to get done that were more minimal. I feel like now in 2024, there's so many things you can do to enhance, like you said, your natural beauty, but not have to go the full like way of getting actual surgery. So I think it's interesting now because more people are comfortable talking about it because some of the things that they're doing are less invasive. And again, just like a a slight tweak to what you already were given when you were born. Yeah, people are just more likely to 
be willing to just, and I never ask anybody to post. They willingly post, but they're just, they're, they're oftentimes people are happy to share. Hey, mm-hmm. I did a little Botox here. I, I mean, I did a little, little, little thing. They're yeah. happy to share that, but they would never in a million years tell somebody, oh, I had anesthesia and I, we made incisions and tightened yeah. things up. They, every now and then, so some high profile people was willing to share that. Mm-hmm. Chrissy Teigen shared, we did her buckle fat removal. Like mm-hmm. she willingly shared that. Uh, there are people who do share things, but most of the time, they're not really readily willing to share that where they're willing to share the less invasive things. Right. That makes sense. So what would you say, aside from Botox and like lip filler, are like the one thing that almost every celebrity you see has done? Well, s- taking care of their skin. I mean, people yeah. are always taking care of their skin. That's a never ending battle. And we help many of them with that, with mm-hmm. the diamond instafacial. Almost every celebrity you see is doing something like that. Of course. And... It'd be rare to find a celebrity who's not doing little things, if not major things. Yeah. It'd be rare <laughs> to find one who's not doing some minimally based facial. For me, it's my patients. They're doing facial sculpting. You would yeah. never know. You'll watch TV tonight, and you'll, there will be a hundred people on TV that I've just done that for. You would never know. Yeah. Um, so little facial sculpting things, you know, strategic preventative Botox, not something that's going to necessarily show, but that will prevent mm-hmm. their aging. So little, let us live very strategic to keep things up and prevent right. aging. That's very common. And again, there are tons of, you know, tons of who have had little neck lifts, little yeah. mini facelifts, and you would never know. Um, so it runs the whole gamut. There's mm-hmm. not one answer to what they're all yeah, doing. Yeah, well, everyone you know. across yeah, the yeah. board. I want to talk a little bit more about your technique. So there's obviously a million places to go to get plastic surgery. You can go to med spas, you can go to doctors. There's not a shortage of places to go. So can you talk a little bit about what facial sculpting is or your specific form of facial sculpting and what makes it different? Yeah, so one of the things that I, to this day, am a leading pioneer and expert on are facial implants. I built my career based on customizing facial implants. And even to this day, there's only a small handful of surgeons who customize implants. Most doctors will open them up out of a package and put them in and maybe just go maybe vary just between a small, medium, or large size, right. but I customize them. I make them. So I'm, so when I'm customizing them, no two are ever the same. They are there. They're designed to fit that patient's individual anatomy. Based on my designing of these implants day in, day out, where we would literally, we do it differently now, but then I would get a CT scan of somebody's, like a, 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 an image of somebody's face, and then, and then we would build an actual life-size replica of that person's skull mm-hmm. okay again we don't do, now we do it with computers on but we but this is how we did it then mm-hmm. so i'd have these life-size replica of these pe- people's skulls right in front of me and then i would take putty and literally with my hands craft implants wherever i wanted them to go and i would make them with like play-doh almost with yeah. putty and create these implants that would hug the bony contours and project out exactly how i want them. i'd spend hours on one little spot doing this all over the face again now it's much more streamlined in a computerized system but that's how we were doing it and so i did that for years and then one day i was like it just hit me with like a ton of bricks i could inject this in a, in a five minute procedure. And so I'm like, this should work. I don't see why this wouldn't work. And nobody was doing this. This yeah. wasn't how fillers were done. And so I started doing that. And the results immediately were amazing. And people were like, oh my God, this is awesome. And quickly we coined that the term diamond facial sculpting. Yeah. That's what this term is. It's become a huge part of what I do. It's what, even though I'm a surgeon and I do 10 hour surgeries, three days a week, I love these major surgeries. This is one of my favorite things to do. And it takes five minutes yeah. and people walk out looking awesome. Uh, so that's what diamond facial sculpting is. Mm-hmm. And it's a lot different than, than the average run of the mill facial filler. Okay. So I have come to you before as a patient and I've done sculpting with you and I've absolutely loved the results. I found that your technique and the best way I could compare it to someone else I've gone to in the past is that you like literally drill the needle into the bone. Can you talk a little bit about what that does versus just putting the filler right yeah. underneath the skin? People always say, oh, you're drilling into my brain. You're drilling. Into my brain. <laughs> you can attest to it. It hurts less than the standard. You don't feel it at all. It hurts less than this. It sounds gnarly and painful and intense, but it actually hurts less than the typical every single day dermal filler at your med spot. It hurts much less because there's no nerves on the bone. So when I'm going into the bone, there's no nerves there. So even Mm -hmm. though it sounds intense, let's start just start by saying people find it less painful than Botox. Okay. So I am enhancing somebody's 
and maximizing somebody's bony structure. That's what I'm doing with facial sculpting. Not only does it enhance contours and angularity and balance and symmetry, but it can also lift in the appropriate circumstance for, yeah. the, for the right person. It can also give a lift. So it does all these things. How does that differ from your run-of-the-mill filler? It differs 180 degrees from it. Even the name, these are dermal fillers. They're meant to go right under the skin, right under the dermis. Mm -hmm. Facial sculpting is completely different. I am nowhere near the dermis. I'm as far away from the dermis as the sun. Okay, <laughs> we're nowhere near it. I'm lifting off of a stable surface, which dermal fillers can't do. Dermal fillers go right under the skin and people may claim they lift. They, if they're just under the skin, which is where everybody puts them, they're just going to get weighed down with time. There's nothing right. supporting them and they're going to not look necessary. They might look good while you're swollen temporarily. And it's not that people aren't, there aren't other good injectors out there. That'd be very egotistical for me to say. I'm not saying there aren't, but I can tell you with a hundred percent confidence certainly diamond facial sculpting is a far superior technique mm -hmm. why doesn't everybody do it because there's a lot of anatomy you need to navigate there's there's blood vessels and nerves and arteries and all kinds of things that you need to understand right. when you're going that deep so you don't cause a problem but if you know as a facial expert i know i could pick out those blood vessels and nerves and blood and arteries with my eyes closed i know exactly right. i know exactly where they are to avoid them right. and so but it is a far superior technique yeah well, I can attest to that because I personally have gotten it done and I don't, I'm outing myself officially. Here I am like a 25 year old owning to the fact that I have done it before. And honestly, no one has ever noticed in the best way possible. You can't be like, oh, did you get your chin done? I can like tell that your chin looks longer or bigger. Or there's filler there or something you would literally never know. But as a compliment to you, not as like a, yeah. you didn't do anything. It's like really very unique to be able to get that done because Again, I've done filler before in my cheeks where they'll put it right there and I've noticed it literally just either moves or it when it's swollen for the first 20 minutes or the first day, 24 hours, you can see that there's a little bit of swelling so it looks like a cheekbone and then the next day it's almost as if the filler was water. And yeah. It's just gone. <clears throat> and you hear a very common thing. People talk about filler migration and ways uh, you hear it every day. I, I, you don't, that, does, that just does not happen with facial sculpting. Where do you think the line needs to be drawn between normalizing and accepting people doing what they want with their bodies and being comfortable and confident in that and you know, it being too much and people needing to just appreciate their natural beauty. I don't think I have a good answer. For me, it's a, it's on a case by case basis. You know, I can only, I can only handle the topic as it relates to my patients and the people that I see, you know, and so I take it on an individual by individual basis. But if basically, if I see somebody who has an issue that legitimately affects their self-esteem that I can safely and easily fix, then I think that's a good candidate if they're doing it for the right reason. It's so commonplace now and it's become so mainstream that I don't think there's as much stigma attached to this type of, of discussion. However, in the past, it was like, oh, you're so vain, you want to get lip filler, you want to get it. Well, it's, it's no different. I've always said it's no different than somebody going to the gym. The, the world is filled with billions of people who go to the gym because yeah, people want to be healthier, but they want to look better. You know, dealing with something on your face, it's no different than someone, than the world going to the gym because they want to look good. They want to have good self. They want to improve their self-esteem. They want that six pack. They want their muscles to rip, whatever. They want to lose weight. It's for, yeah, is it vain? Well, maybe, but it's to help them feel good about what they see. Well, you can't exercise your face, your, your, the bump off your nose. You can't exercise away the, uh, a higher, uh, you know, a flat cheekbone. Like there are things you, so, so if I feel like I can improve somebody's self-esteem and make them feel better about what they see, then to me, that's a good candidate. Yeah. Okay. There's, a real slippery slope with people who have body dysmorphia and people who are have mental health issues that it can be hard to weed out. Is this person yeah. doing this because they think it's going to cure their depression or it's going to, you know, it's going to help them keep their boyfriend or whatever the case right. may be. There are people on a weekly basis. I'll see that. I'll, I'll tell them you're not a good candidate for this. This is not going to make you happy. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it happens all the time. And even recently, just a couple of weeks ago, a very good, I don't want to say best friend, but a guy that I've known for years, he called me a couple of, year, a couple of weeks ago and he said, hey, you know, my, my daughter 
this thing about going to Turkey. She already booked her flight. She's 22. Yeah. She booked her flight to Turkey to get a nose job because she only has enough money to go there. She's $5,000 and they're going to do it for her. He said, what do you think? I said, that's a terrible idea. I said, let me, I said, look, let me see her. I, I you know, I, we, that, that price is not, it's not even possible here, but I was like, you know, you, you might want to step in and yeah. maybe contribute so that she, because it's who not, knows, not who, knows? At least who knows? So he said, okay, he brought her in and I saw her and she has terrible body dysmorphia. She was not, um, she was not in a mental place, the not of good mental health at currently to even have a surgery. Never mind. So, so we had a long discussion about it, and I told him this girl needs she needs help, and he said she's actually getting help, but it's not really doing that much. He said that she needs like more intensive help because she yeah. was not mentally well, right? And yet she was going to run off to Turkey, and some guy was going to do it. People, so patient. The bottom line is, patients like that that can make their psychology worse. A lot worse. It, yeah. It's not going to help them at all. The surgery doesn't will never help them mm -hmm. alleviate their body dysmorphia. That's not the answer. The answer is to get mental, you know, mental health um, help, and and then go from there. And at some point, when somebody is in a much much healthier mental space then yeah then sure you can convert somebody into a good surgical candidate but when they're not stable mentally stable that that surgery will never ever help them yeah it might tip them over the edge and make them make much it worse, worse. Yeah. yeah yeah well to share my story i actually went to you in 2017 i hated my face i felt like my face was chubby i felt like i had a double chin i did not know what like what to do about it. I was like, maybe if I just go see someone and like take care of it. I used to be a very intense athlete when I was in high school. I was captain of the field hockey team, worked out very intensely. I was I had a bigger build. I was eating steaks five days a week. Yeah. I was bulking. I was yeah. deadlifting two hundred twenty pounds. Like wow. I was in oh a my God. different mindset, like trying to That's be a awesome. college <laughs> athlete. I came to you a year after stopping being an athlete, just cold turkey went from being almost like a college level athlete to then going to college and drinking for the first time and eating the way I used to eat as a field hockey player, which was a very different type of body build and size. Mm -hmm. I was doing all these different things and I started gaining a ton of weight. And then I would try to diet and see like what was going on with my body and I could not get the weight off. Like even if I did go back to the gym and try to eat healthier, it was really hard. And so I came to you thinking that you could fix all my problems and was like, I remember going into your office, you did the photos of my face. We sat together and you were telling me, look, like you could work on your chin. Like we could do some work there. Like your chin is like not as long. You could try facial sculpting or, you know, down the line, if you're financially up for it, you can do a chin implant. And I was like, oh my God, like, I can't do this. Like, I was like, my dad would kill me. Like, <laughs> how am I going to get away with this? Like this, I can't do that. So I was like, I took everything you gave me and then I went home and I just processed it. And I was like, I remember you said to me, you were like, why don't, you're not ready yet. So why don't you just take this information for what it is? I'm, you were like, I'm here. And I think I came in maybe four more times and just had you look at my face. And I was like, I think there were a few times where I actually got numbed and then chickened out. So I remember coming in multiple times before I ever actually let you touch my face. And then I finally was like, okay, I'm doing this for myself. I'm not doing it because I want like a whole new perfect face or a whole new perfect body, but I'm doing this because I'm ready to do it. And that's when we finally actually did it for the first time. And I was like, this is the best thing ever. Like it looks great. Oh, that's great. But that is my story of when like the first few times that I came to you, it was actually like a whole process. So to your point of, knowing a good candidate, I really appreciated that you weren't like, let's do it. You need this. Yeah. Like it'll totally change your face. You need to do it now. Yeah. Oh, that's what a great story. I love that story. And thanks <laughs> for telling me that I would see it's there's, it's really cool to hear that because yeah, I take care of thousands and of thousands course. of people and I, they all have a story and I don't know that about, but that I would have never remembered that, you know, but that's great. I love it. <laughs> and yeah. I don't think I even told that's you awesome. at the time. I just kept coming back. But once I was ready, I was ready. And that's why I feel actually comfortable talking about it right now. I think that's maybe like the question I asked you to go back to that. I think maybe that is where the line is. I actually personally think anything you do get done that you're not comfortable sharing, maybe you're not fully ready to get it done. And that doesn't mean you have to share it on Instagram or share it to the world, but if you're having to completely hide it, you know, maybe that's a sign that you're not fully ready to do it. Or so, I mean, some people really don't want to share that they got a full on 
facelift. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that point of view. I don't know if I agree with that. I think people can be self-conscious about things that they're embarrassed to tell even their closest friends about that because yeah. I see it all the time. I see all the time. Someone will, people will be self-conscious about things that they're just ashamed of. Yeah. And, and you know, and I tell them, don't be ashamed of me. You're preaching to the choir here. You know, like this yeah. is a safe space, man. I'm, I'm here to help, you know, like, and so, but I see people who are like, and then we take care of it. And so I don't necessarily think that, that they need to be willing to share it with people before they're a good candidate. I just think they need to understand why they're doing it. Make sure that they're comfortable for themselves for to sure. do it. I don't think they necessarily have it, but I appreciate your point of view, but no, I, I, I don't think they need I to share it. I see both sides, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a very fair point. Where do you think the line should be drawn of celebrities being open about having plastic surgery solely because of the platforms that they have and the amount of people they have looking up to them? Do you have an opinion on it being some moral obligation to be transparent and honest when they're, you know, promoting certain beauty standards? I mean, that's a good question. It's a hard question. It's a hard question <laughs> because the population at large is looking to these celebrities for their beauty ideals. For sure that happens. And yeah. then, and does that contribute to a lot of the issues that these, you know, 17 year old boys and girls are looking at, you know, a 28 year old supermodel who probably has had a lot of little things done yeah. to make themselves look perfect. And, you know, the 17 year olds looking at that picture going, you know, why don't I look like that? And, and that can cause self-esteem issues to the, to the younger people looking. And then they feel like, why don't I look at that when they don't, they realize that person has had help to get there, you, you know, so it can create issues, but you know, am I going to sit here and tell the celebrities you should all say, no, I mean, that's, you know, a lot of these celebrities, listen, this is their livelihood. They're making their money. They're making their living based on the brand they've created. And maybe it would hurt their brand to say, yeah, you know, I wasn't born like this. I, I'm not going to tell somebody go blow your cover <laughs> because you're going to help the world at large. It, it's, it's, it, it, that, that, the answer to that question is above my pay grade. I think, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's a right answer, but mm -hmm. I do see there are issues that are caused by it. For sure. For sure. I agree with you on all the things that you said. Where do you think the line should be drawn then on a celebrity actively publicly stating that they've never had any work done? Yeah. So I've seen many times where, a celebrity will say they never had anything done. And I know that's not true from <laughs> firsthand experience, you know? <laughs> and so that, that happens quite often. And, you know, I kind of, I think that that, I kind of wish that they, they'd rather just not say anything. Mm -hmm. I would never tell somebody they need to reveal what they did ever. It's their right to privacy. Like I, I, you know, I don't tell everybody that I usually tell people the things I did, but there might be things that I don't want people to know about me. And, Every person who sees me has that absolute right, and I respect that 100%. Yeah. I would just rather have them not say anything than, than to say I've never done anything. And then, again, just because it creates unrealistic beauty ideals for younger population, following yeah. them on social media and things like that. That's yeah. the only reason is is that I, I'd prefer that they just don't say anything rather than to, like, rather than to not be truthful about it. Yeah. I agree. I think just don't say anything at all. Okay, I want to talk about something even more taboo. A lot of the, what we've been seeing in the media in the last year, two years is about Ozempic and that drug being, you know, heavily used, yeah. especially in the celebrity community. There's a lot of talk about Ozempic face and how it's affecting a lot of people, making yeah. them more hollow. And I know that as you age, you get more hollow. So can you talk about how this Ozempic craze and, you know, notion has affected anything in your line of work? And are people coming in actually asking to put more into their face because of the way it's impacting them? Yeah, that's a great question. It is a very uh, prevalent topic in today's, yeah. today's age, for sure. I, I don't go a day without seeing five people who are on Ozempic. Yeah. And what are the downsides from a cosmetic standpoint? Well, what we know about it is that people don't improve their body composition when they lose weight. Meaning, meaning if somebody starts and they're overweight, but mm -hmm. they're at 30% body fat, when they're on Ozempic, let's say they lose 30 pounds, they're still at 30% body fat right. they, because they're losing muscle and bone density. They're losing everything, not just fat. Absolutely. And that doesn't help your, that doesn't help your 
cosmetic appearance at all. I don't want to say it all, but it doesn't make them necessarily healthier in a way that they should be healthier because right. it's better to have more muscle mass and less body fat. So a lot of people do see the consequences in their face and their body. They see a, def a deflating of their of their anatomy and when the when the body deflates it's like a beach ball losing air it becomes more flaccid more wrinkly skin quality you know the the superficial texture or skin quality yeah. um deteriorates a bit it does create a definitely a cosmetic deficit that people are aware of and so yeah it's a common thing we're doing to help improve that now yeah so that's like a new thing that you're having to like yeah people used to come in to like want things taken out of their face and now you're probably having to add because of Oh, yes. Big? Yes. Very interesting. What is, you know, your recommendation and what are the, maybe the downsides of someone my age being on Ozempic long-term if they want to have work done in the future? You don't want to be on that stuff long-term because mm -hmm. you're going to lose muscle mass and for, for health and for cosmetics, you want your muscle mass. You don't want to lose your muscle mass. Yeah. It doesn't look good and it makes you less healthy. Now, as far as the future goes, what I'm finding in facial surgery, so I'm one of the few people I actually am seeing inside the body of what the, because most of these people are on Ozempic, are in the business of looking their best. And so many of these people come in for facelifts. Mm -hmm. And now that this has been around for several years, we've done many facelifts. Some people have lost weight with Ozempic. When we say you lose muscle mass from it, well, guess what? There's muscles in the face too. Mm -hmm. And guess what also? The success of a facelift comes from the muscle layer integrity we right. use that to support everything and what i'm finding is that that layer that muscle layer is actually gotten thinner and less sturdy on people which makes the ability to support a facelift to to keep it the underlying structure supported it makes it less effective yeah. and so so it can affect the results it can definitely affect the results of a facelift and there's other things that you might have to do now to deal with people who have an ozempic face when you're doing surgery right. on these people and so i would think about the long term implications of that as well as a mo just a motivating factor to get off it and let your lifestyle carry you for the rest of the way. So interesting. One other topic I want to get into is the cost of plastic surgery. Obviously most plastic surgery, almost all plastic surgery is not covered by insurance and I'm sure there, there's a million reasons why, but my question to you is what do you recommend for someone who can't necessarily afford to come to you? What do you recommend for them to do in a situation where they don't live here or aren't in a space to afford your practice or your services, what would you recommend for someone to do? And why is it sometimes worth the investment? I always tell people, this is not the place to try to like get a bargain, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, like get a bargain on your handbags and your watches and you know, your shoes, try and get a bargain there. Don't try and get a bargain on your face. Like if you can afford to do what you do, then do it. If you can't, then maybe wait until you can, because you can get into trouble when you're bargain hunting with facial work we see it all the time people going to different countries and tijuana and turkey and wherever and do people have success stories going to the place yeah i've heard, I've heard that oh i spent two thousand dollars i went to you know syria and i got this all this stuff <laughs> that would have cost me a hundred thousand dollars yeah sure there are some success stories but you hear some very tragic stories as well yeah um and so i would just say if you can't afford it, you wait. And that doesn't mean come to me. Listen, there's no see, I'm I'm not the cheapest yeah. guy in the block. But you know, if you found somebody you trust and you want to go to and you can't afford them, then you might you might just wait like until you can afford it. You, yeah. you know, that that would be my recommendation rather than to sniff out the best bargain you can because this is not a commodity. It's not like, well, you bought an apple from one place, but the apple's cheaper than others. I'm just gonna get that one. This is not Yeah comparing the price of apples like it's <laughs> so different yeah two doctors are completely even though both might be doing mm -hmm. buckle fat reduction or whatever that doesn't mean that surgery is going to come out the same mm -hmm. just because both doc two different doctors are doing the same procedure you absolutely know. Yeah, yeah yeah okay i have one more question for you and then we're going to wrap things up have have you ever been told that you're like the real life mcdreamy or mark sloan from gray's anatomy i'll tell you a funny story about that <laughs> so and he won't mind me saying this. I could use his name. One of my best friends is Eric Dane. Mm -hmm. Eric Dane was McSteamy. He was the McSteamy. Oh, yeah, it is okay. McSteamy. Yeah, Eric was McSteamy. Patrick Dempsey was McDreamy. McDreamy. You're right. You're Eric right. Dane was McSteamy. <laughs> so Eric and I were, he's one of my best friends. Mm -hmm. And before he got that role, 
he was, you know, he was, you know, he's now a very well established, famous, successful, amazing actor. Yeah. But before Grey's Anatomy, you know, he had he was you know bouncing from audition to audition. I mean, yeah. he had some things, but nothing that made him like really world famous at the time. Even though he was great, but he yeah. was young and he was building. So we were out playing golf together and, you know, I, I think I was just getting started in my practice. So I think I had a day free and he had nothing going on. So we would play golf whenever we could. And he said, I think I'm getting an audition for Grey's Anatomy to be a plastic surgeon. He's like, so can you, can we go over some suturing techniques and stuff? <laughs> and so we went, we, we went and we, we worked on suture techniques That's and amazing. how to hold instruments. And I told him, this is how, what you're going to see on TV, which is wrong. This is the right way to do it. You never see this on TV. Right? So we yeah. practiced this That's and we were amazing. at some restaurant practicing with like utensils and stuff. And I was teaching all this stuff and he got his audition for Grey's Anatomy. And I went with him to the audition for it. And he made his choices based on me because I was an up and coming surgeon. Yeah. So he made his choices. He went with a beard. Like I grew a goatee at the time because at the time I was trying to look older. I wanted to look older. Yeah, so facial hair made me look older. He had a goatee for the role. Like That's all his hilarious. choices were based on on me. Yeah. And and he got the role as Mc, he got it. He got the <laughs> role as McSteamy. Yeah, I, I always thought you guys kind of looked alike. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You we, guys have a lot of similar things, and I'm a big Grey's Anatomy person. And he was like one of my favorite characters, so yeah. it's just so funny because I remember the first time I went to you, I was like, "He's kind of like Mark Sloan in real life." Yeah. So after he got the role, like I don't know, a month later, he said, "Hey, do you want?" It was a Saturday. I didn't have kids yet, and he and I uh, and his wife at the time, Rebecca Gayhart, and my wife, we were all supposed to go to dinner mm -hmm. on. A, it was a Saturday, and we had a Saturday night dinner reservation or something, but he was working that morning. He calls me at like 11 o'clock. He says, hey, do you want to come up to the set? They are, we've got that we're doing a scene where this kid's got some tumors on his head and the medical director of the show, um, she, she wants, she wants, she asked me if you, if I can call you to come up to do some surgical markings on him mm -hmm. as though a real, like markings that are, that would be legit, like, Right. I said, yeah, I got nothing to do. So I came up there and I saw this kid with his prosthetic tumors on his face. And I made, I took a marking pen and I made surgical markings That's as amazing. though we would really, really make if we were really doing the surgery because they wanted it to be as authentic as possible. Yeah. And I did that for 40 minutes or whatever. And then that was over. We were done by 12. And then they said, the producer came up and said, hey, I really appreciate it. Do you want to be in a scene? Do you want to be in a scene with, uh, you know, we just really appreciate it. You want know, to yeah. be fun? I said, yeah, what the hell? It sounds fun. <laughs> They're like, great. We'll have you assisting Patrick Dempsey doing a surgery. We'll have yeah. you scrub in and assist. I was like, it sounds awesome. So this was at like one o'clock we decide. Mm -hmm. So I call my wife and I said, hey, I said, uh, you know, I said, I'm not, because we might, I maybe we're going to lunch or something. I can't remember. I said, yeah. hey, I'm going to stick around. They're going to, and, and Eric was right next to me. I said, they're going to, they're going to put me in a scene. Mm -hmm. I said, but we have dinner at seven. I'll, I'll be home by four or five. And Eric looks at me and goes, no, you won't. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, you're not going home by, I said, dinner at seven. He goes, no, you're not making dinner not at seven. <laughs> I was like, we're doing, aren't we doing one scene? He's like, Tell her you're going to be home at like 10. I'm like, I, well, Eric says I'm going to be home at 10. So, and sure enough, we filmed one scene a hundred different times with the yep. cameras here, the cameras here, the cameras here, the cameras. And like that one it's scene. Crazy. So I was in it. I was actually in Grey's Anatomy. Wait, I need to look back. I'm I was watch in Grey's that. Anatomy. Yep. And, uh, I, and people even said, hey, I, was that you? <laughs> but I was in there assisting Patrick Dempsey, who was the neurosurgeon doing this neurosurgery yeah. or something. And uh, yeah, and I didn't get home till like 10.30 that night. Were you playing... <laughs> Mark Sloan or no, I wasn't just, playing Mark Sloan. I was just playing, playing an, assistant. Like an assistant. I was just playing an assistant. That is amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to have to find that yeah, episode. Yeah, yeah. That yeah it was a kid amazing. with the name of the, the name of the, they called his tumor lionitis. Lion, like he had like okay. a lion head lie. That was. Oh, I yeah, remember that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm going to watch that yeah, today. Yeah. I need to dial into that. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. My final thing we're going to do at the end of every episode, I do this thing called Alpes three and it's basically my way of including music in the podcast. Cause I love music so i don't know if you play music when you do surgery i do what are your three favorite songs to operate to i'd say uh even flow from pearl is pearl jam okay <laughs> i'd say wake me up from evanescence you're lying <laughs> someone's on lying. the table passed lying. out and you're <laughs> <lying>. <laughs> I'm dead. And I'd say, uh let's see i'd say welcome to the jungle guns and roses that's amazing 
wow, okay, well, if I ever get surgery, I'll know what's really going on while I'm laying yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for joining me. I know you're a busy man and you have so much going on, so I really appreciate you taking the time to be here. I think that, you know, this is a really interesting episode. This is a lot of interesting information for my listeners. I hope that everyone listening feels like they just took something away from this. So, and I definitely did. So thank you so much. And yeah, thank you for coming on. My pleasure. It was fun. Thank you everyone for listening. We will be back next week with another episode of Trying to Figure It Out.